Good evening, everyone. Good evening, great, hi. I'm Caroline Angel Burke. I'm the Vice President for Education, Visitor Experience and Collections here at the Institute. Welcome to the Senate Chamber. We're honored to have you with us here this evening for a very special event. Not only will we be considering an important piece of legislation currently before the United States Senate, but we'll be able to participate in this debate, just like senators do. And the topic, of course, is pay equity. What makes this institute unique and what makes me so passionate about the work that we do is our ability as a high-tech, immersive museum to pivot and to address the current and important topics that are driving conversations and public policy across the nation. Here, we seek to provide a platform for considered dialogue and healthy debate on an important policy issues and moments in our history, and tonight's program is no exception. Tonight, you'll experience our Today's Vote program, where each month we take on a different piece of legislation that's currently in front of the United States Senate, educate our visitors about the topic at hand, and then invite them to stand up and share their opinions on the bill before electronically voting on the legislation with their fellow senators. It's remarkable and frankly quite inspiring to see the range of discussions driven by our visitors who, with complete strangers, will stand up in the Senate chamber and passionately advocate for their personal beliefs as it relates to this real piece of legislation. In this chamber, we have tackled such topics as gun control, immigration reform, the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, and the authorization to use military force against ISIL. I'm thrilled that you will all be experiencing our most up-to-date and recent today's vote tonight. But before we launch into our program, I'm honored to introduce a leader who's been an advocate for pay equity here in Massachusetts for literally decades. Senator Pat Jalen has represented Massachusetts' second Middlesex district in the Senate since 2005, and prior to that served in the State House of Representatives starting in 1991. In 1998, following the Supreme Judicial Court ruling against pay equity for female cafeteria workers in Everett, then Representative Jalen and Alice Wolf first filed legislation to strengthen pay equity laws here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. For over 15 years, the senator, other legislators, and a coalition of concerned citizens fought to move this bill forward. Their dedication to the cause, their willingness to listen to the opposition, and ability to revise their legislative strategy led them to victory this year when legislation was passed unanimously in both the House and the Senate and the bill was signed into law by Governor Charlie Baker on August 1st. As with the passage of health care reform in Massachusetts in 2006, enactment of the pay equity law, which prevents pay discrimination for comparable work based on gender, has the Commonwealth once again leading the nation. While the U.S. Congress has yet to pass legislation that would guarantee equitable pay in all states, there is legislation pending before the Senate that would do just that. This bill, S-862, or the Paycheck Fairness Act, was introduced by Senator Barbara Mikulski of Maryland in 2015 and is the bill that you will tonight be considering. As Senator Jalen will no doubt attest, progress is a process. We look forward to hearing from her now about the bill she advanced at the state level and her thoughts on national enactment. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Senator Pat Jalen. Well, it's really great to be here at the Edward M. Kennedy Institute. The Senate came here uh, when we were not even open yet. Uh, and got to sit in the very seats that you're in. But we didn't have the full experience, so I'm going to get that tonight. Um, the Institute celebrates the work of Ted Kennedy and the United States Senate, and that's so important right now, I think, because the media and the public are focused entirely 
on the presidential candidates as if one person can make things happen in Washington. And no president can be successful without the engagement of people in the House and Senate. And this institute shows examples of times when the branches have worked together to make historic change. And it's important to recognize people like Ted Kennedy, heroes who made history in many ways. In fact, I was thinking as I came here tonight, um, the very last months of his life, he was working to make sure that the social safety net was extended to long-term care for seniors and people with disabilities and passing the Class Act. Uh, it didn't survive after he didn't survive, but that was such an important activity and I hope we can revive that. So the Institute also, besides celebrating him and the Senate, I think can play an important role in helping each of us understand that we make history too, either with our participation or with our passivity. So the bill we're talking about tonight is an example. I was the lead sponsor of the pay equity bill that was signed into law, and it is the model for future uh, federal legislation. So I get my name in the paper, and I get to speak here tonight. But the bill would never have passed without lots and hundreds, hundreds of people working, as you said, for many years. In 1989, 41 women who were cafeteria workers in Everett brought a lawsuit saying that they did equally skilled, hard work, just as responsibly as the male janitors lifting heavy uh, boxes of tomato cans, uh, working to clean things up. And yet, they were paid half as much, and they were told, you're just working for pin money. So it took nine years in court. First they won, then they lost. And they lost when the Supreme Judicial Court, in a four to three vote in 1998, said the legislature hasn't defined what comparable work is, so it has to be the same work. It can't be comparable work. So, so uh, Representative Alice Wolf and I and Jackie um, Cook from the Women's Bureau of the Labor Department decided we should define what comparable work was, and so we wrote that bill. And we worked on it for many years with the support of many women's groups, and we made some gains. The first time we testified in favor of that bill before the Commerce and Labor Committee, we looked up and there was an entire group of white males. There were no women on the Commerce and Labor Committee. <laughs> and my former colleague, Carol Donovan, remembers those days. And so, among other things, we went and spoke to the speaker who said, oh, I never noticed that. And Soon there were women on the Commerce and Labor Committee, and eventually we started getting favorable reports from that committee, but we never got it passed in either house. So two years ago, as we prepared for session, my staff and I said, let's make this the time. And we worked with particularly uh, MassNow, the Women's Bar Association, and the, um, the Commission on the Status of Women, but they built a coalition that was so big that it took pages, they taped all the pages together and go from here down to the floor. And they did not only organizing, but they did research and reaching out to different constituencies and worked with the business community. Uh, instead of weakening our bill to get the support of, of others, we actually made it a stronger, a broader and more effective bill. So, do I need to convince you, because you read all the time, that women in Massachusetts make 82 cents uh, for every man's dollar? Some s people say it's because of our choices, that women choose the caring professions. We don't know how to negotiate. We take off time to be with our families. But we knew from both studies and anecdotes that there are real barriers to women and minorities getting equal pay. And the coalition helped us identify those barriers and write a bill that addressed them. We worked with Attorney General Maura Healy and her staff, the Ways and Means Committee in the Senate under uh, Chair Karen Spilka, that probably made a difference, um, and helped make it a stronger bi bill. And eventually, we got the help of the Alliance for Business Leadership and the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce to write provisions that addressed the concerns of, of businesses and got their support. 
So these are three barriers to equity for wi both women, but also for women and also for um, African Americans and, and Latino workers. So first, the first barrier is uh, pay secrecy. So you remember L Lily Ledbetter's case where she found out after 19 years that she was being paid. Oh, there is Jackie Kirk. Now I have to be careful. Um, so in, in Lily Ledbetter, only after over a decade of working for less than her colleagues, found out that she was making less. So our bill says employers can't keep you from talking to your colleagues about how much you all make. And the second barrier is salary history. Women start out, in many cases, at lower pay, and every time they pay, apply for a new job and the employer asks their sal salary history, they become locked into lo lower salaries their whole career. And that adds up, and when they retire, they have lower um, retirement income, and probably many of them end in poverty or insecurity. We heard of one woman who had a great phone interview, and at the end of it, she didn't hang up. And she heard the people on the other end saying, she sounded so great, but she's making so little, she must not be worth very much, and she didn't get the job. That was just an example of why the salary history is so important. And I didn't realize when we passed this bill, it was the first in the, in the nation. And since then, other people are filing it, including in the federal Congress. So finally, the last issue we, we addressed is that much discrimination, I believe, is unconscious. A woman CEO told us that she didn't realize the dis uh, disparities in her own organization until she did a self-assessment for her business. And when she did, she addressed it. So the most important bill, piece of the bill, in my opinion, is that if you are a business owner and you look around and you do a self-assessment, an honest self-assessment, and you address the problems you find, then you help immunize yourself against future lawsuits. So that's what we're hoping for. The bill was much better than the bill we started with, thanks to a lot of people. It will make a difference. It will re reduce income inequality. Fewer women will raise their children in poverty and those children will have a better chance to succeed. But our work is not done because this bill will only help people who are working for a single employer. For example, the cafeteria workers and the janitors. It's not gonna help people who take care of children get paid as much as people who take care of cars. Equal pay is not the same as comparable work. Jobs that have been considered women's work will still be paid less. The jobs that women's used to do for nothing, caring for children, caring for seniors, caring for disabled people, but also cleaning, cooking, and serving food will, are still going to be paid less, even under this bill. Which is more important to you, your children and your parents, or your money? When, you're, when, we care, when we pay the people who care for our children as much as we pay for the people who care for our money, we will know we have comparable pay for comparable work. Comparable worth, sorry. So the new law will help thousands of women, thousands of people who are minorities make more progress towards fair pay. And we look forward to the law's implementation in 2018, and we look forward to other states and the federal government learning from our work. And I thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Jalen, for that. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Louis Rocco. I'm the education program facilitator here at the Edward M. Kennedy Institute. And I'm gonna be helping run the Today's Vote program that we're gonna move into uh, right now. So. On your tablets that you see uh, on your desks, you should be on a screen with a button that says join this vote. Just go ahead and tap that button for me. That's all you have to do. And you should eventually see a blue screen with either a time on it. If it has a message on it that says something to the effect of uh, there are no more votes this evening, disregard that. There are. We're going to do one in just a few minutes. Uh, but you're just looking for a blue screen. If anybody's having any difficulty getting to that screen, just raise your hand. Uh, and we can come over and get you another tablet.
But once again, just to reiterate, if you see that blue screen, either with a time or uh, a message on it, you're just looking for that blue screen, you're in the right place. Uh, otherwise, just hang tight, we'll come around and get you a tablet as we go. Um, for the record, since uh, as we get folks those tablets, I just want to point out, some of you may be noticing that you're sitting at a desk with a blue or a red sign in front of it. Um, those signs indicate the 34 senators in the actual U.S. Senate who are currently up for re-election this November. It's an exhibit that we've had for quite a while. Obviously, the, uh, the color of the sign will tell you the party of that senator. Democrats generally sit on this side of the center aisle or the middle aisle or the dividing aisle or the DMZ sometimes. Uh, they generally sit on this side. Uh, and then the red signs indicate Republican senators. As you can see, quite a large number, about 24 of the 34 senators who are up for re-election are Republicans. Uh, the initials will, of course, give you the state, and then if you look on the bottom of all of those signs, it'll give you the name of the actual United States Senator whose desk you're sitting at. If you're not sitting at a desk with a sign on it, don't worry, you're not up for re-election in a couple of months or in a month or so, so you're all set. Um, but I just want to check in now. Is there anybody that still doesn't have a tablet with a blue screen on it in front of them? Anybody still need a tablet? All right, looks like we're all good to go. Uh, so we're going to start this program with a brief introductory video here uh, on our big board behind me. Welcome to the Senate Chamber at the Edward M. Kennedy Institute. This room is a full-scale recreation of the chamber in the U.S. Capitol in Washington. The Senate Chamber has been the venue for key moments in American history and democracy, including the passage of landmark bills into law, momentous civil rights debates, and decisions on matters of war and peace. Today, as senators in training, this is your chamber, and you can experience the lawmaking process for yourself. You will have the chance to speak your mind and cast your vote on a bill actively under consideration by Congress. Good luck. Senate will come to order. Good evening, Senators. Once again, welcome to the Senate Chamber. Very happy you could join us for a late night session of the Senate. It's an important piece of legislation that we have gathered here to discuss. As the video indicated, we are going to uh, introduce, debate, and decide the fate of an active, real piece of legislation. Uh, just so you all know, I'll be playing the part of your presiding officer. As some of us may know, the actual president of the Senate is the vice president, but unfortunately he couldn't make it this evening. So I'm going to play his part. Usually, the presiding officer is a junior member of the majority party, which currently in the Senate is the Republican Party. But if it's okay with everybody here, I'm just going to remain party neutral and just try to uphold order and decorum. That's what this gavel is for, of course. Uh, so, very happy you could all join us. Now, something that's a bit unusual that a presiding officer generally wouldn't do uh, with a piece of legislation is give it some background and context. But I know that many of you are new to the Senate. Some of you have been senators for all of two minutes. So it would probably be helpful for you to have some of that background and context. Why is the Senate actually tackling this issue? So that's what I'm going to do now, provide you with a little bit of background. What role the government should play in the country's economy and the prosperity of its citizens is among the greatest ongoing debates in the United States. This debate includes issues like job creation, wage rates, and the quality of life for workers and their families. It also considers to what extent the government should regulate businesses, subsidize industries, provide social safety nets, or arbitrate disputes between employers and workers. Now, modern labor law in the United States can be traced back to the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, which, among other things, introduced the 40-hour work week, established a national minimum wage, and guaranteed time and a half for overtime in certain jobs. Now, since 1938, this law has been amended several times to address concerns facing the labor market, including discrimination. Notably, in 1963, President John F. Kennedy signed the Equal Pay Act into law, which made it illegal to pay workers a lower wage simply on the basis of their sex. More recent efforts to address disparities in pay between men and women include the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009. This law is, of course, named after Lilly Ledbetter, an employee of the Goodyear Tire Company who sued her employer in 1998 claiming pay discrimination on the basis of her sex. Now, the Supreme Court ultimately sided with Goodyear when they ruled 5-4 to four in 2007 
that Lily Ledbetter had waited too long to sue her employer and that the one a discriminatory wage decision. Notably, the court did not rule on whether uh, or not Goodyear was actually guilty of discriminatory pay practices. So the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act was a response to the Supreme Court's decision. It extended the statute of limitations for equal pay lawsuits to the date of the most recent paycheck rather than the first instance of pay discrimination. Now, despite these legislative victories, both historic and contemporary, women still face discrimination in the workplace. According to the most recent figures from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, despite making up 46.8% of the labor force in the United States, women working full-time, year-round jobs make, on average, 80% of what men make. And that number changes, and rarely for the better, when data is broken down by race, education, occupation, and age. Additionally, Across 116 measured occupations, women earned more than men in only 1.7% or two of them, uh, including as store clerks and order fillers. Women are also vastly underrepresented at the top of the corporate ladder. As of June 2016, women make up 4.2% of CEOs in Fortune 500 companies. So, given this state of affairs, Congress has introduced a number of pieces of legislation designed to guarantee equal opportunities and pay for women in the workplace. And of course, as we've discussed uh, already, the bill that we'll be talking about here today is this one, S-862, the Paycheck Fairness Act. This is a real piece of legislation. I'm holding S-862 in my hand. Anybody could uh, check this out for themselves on congress.gov. Uh, that was introduced on March 15th, 2015, and is currently awaiting a hearing in the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. So that's a lot of background, I understand. But now what I'd like to do, again, a little unusual for a presiding officer to do, is I'd like to outline the major provisions of this bill for you, what the bill would do if it became law. So the Paycheck Fairness Act would amend the Equal Pay Act of 1963 to prohibit discrimination in pay on the grounds of sex and would limit differences in pay to, quote, bona fide factors, end quote, including education, training, and experience. The bill also prohibits retaliation by employers if employees ask about, discuss, or reveal wage information at a company. The bill also makes it illegal to require an employee to sign a contract or a waiver stating that the employee will not disclose wage information. Finally, the bill makes employers who violate sex discrimination prohibitions liable in a civil action for either compensatory or punitive damages. And that's the bill. And that's a lot to throw at freshman senators at their first few minutes in office, I understand. Uh, but we will have an opportunity to review this bill and its provisions, and maybe that background, if you'd like, I'll let you know when that opportunity is going to arise. But usually when a bill like this is put on the legislative uh, calendar and comes to the floor for a vote, it gets a floor debate first, in which senators have the opportunity to air their concerns, comments, grievances, support, opposition, whatever it might be. And we're very lucky. We have two senior senators here with us this evening that have been studying this bill for a very long time, and they have prepared statements for and against it for you to consider. They might, in their statements, clarify any concerns or questions you might have. But if they don't, and you have something to say about this bill after they're done, you're in luck. Because I'm going to open the floor to anybody here, any senator here, who wants to make a statement on this bill after them. But first, we'll get to those senators uh, out of deference and seniority, which is generally the way of the Senate. So, uh, first, I will recognize one of the sponsors of this bill, the Senator from Maryland. Thank you, Mr. President. I come to the floor to finish the job that we began with the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act and end pay discrimination in the workplace once and for all. Now, people say to me, Senator, we passed the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act in order to make sure women had equal pay for equal work. Didn't we solve that problem? Well, we made a good dent, as that bill removed barriers to women suing for pay discrimination. However, the goal of S-862 is for women to not have to sue in the first place. Women still earn 80 cents for every dollar a man makes. It's even worse for women of color. African American women earn 67 cents for every dollar, and Hispanic women only earn 54 cents. 
This disparity not only affects their pay, it affects their retirement and their social security. When you earn less, you get less in your social security benefits because you are making smaller contributions to your retirement. Women's social security benefits are about 71% of men's benefits. A woman earns 20 cents less for every dollar a man earns. Yet women don't get a 20% discount on their student loans. They don't get a 20% discount on their utility bills. They don't get a 20% discount on their mortgage. Mr. President, a number of myths have cropped up concerning this bill, and I'd like to dispel a few of them. Myth number one, the bill would require employers to cut the salaries of their male employees. That simply is not true. The Equal Pay Act, which has been law for over 50 years, prohibits employers from lowering the wages of men to make up for discrimination against women. This bill would not change that. Myth number two, the nation's pay inequality is due to the kinds of careers women choose to pursue. This gap is not about a woman's choice of occupation. Women are paid less than men who are working in the same occupations with the same level of education. Finally, myth number three, the bill would subject employers to criminal penalties for refusing to disclose wage information. Let me be clear, there are no criminal penalties in this bill. No part of this bill provides for criminal penalties for employers for any conduct. It will, however, put an end to the enforced secrecy that exists around wages in many American companies. Currently, a woman can be fired simply for asking what the guy across the hall makes. It's been more than 50 years since the Equal Pay Act was passed. For 50 years, women have been trying to play financial catch-up, to get equal pay for equal work. And every time we make a reform, some loophole appears. We want to close those loopholes. We want to end discrimination. We want to end the retaliation. And most of all, we want to end the fact that women in this country, throughout their entire lives, earn substantially less. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Remains open for prepared statements. Mr. President. The chair recognizes the senator from Nebraska. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I strongly support equal pay for equal work. On that, both parties agree. I also agree that workers should not face retaliation for discussing their wages. So I think it is a shame that this bill, which has good ideas, is being debated without the chance to offer amendments. In its current form, it is not a bill that I can support by adding more regulations to federal laws that already prohibit gender-based wage discrimination, we could end up making things worse for American workers. Over the past 50 years, Equal Pay Act and Civil Rights Act have helped increase opportunities for women and enforce equal pay for equal work. Women now hold more than half of managerial and professional jobs, more than double the number of women in 1980. Women receive 57% of all college degrees, 33% more than in 1970. Commonly used wage gap statistics, like the ones employed by the senator from Maryland, do not tell the full story. When all wages are averaged together, then yes, on average, women make 80 cents for every dollar men make. However, that statistic is not factoring in differences in occupation, education, hours worked, and other personal choices. Those are factors that employers who set wages have no control over. This bill forces employers to prove that they only used bona fide factors in setting wages and makes them liable for potentially unlimited compensatory damages, even when gender discrimination is found to be unintentional. The Paycheck Fairness Act would apply to nearly every business in America. By making it difficult for employers to defeat frivolous lawsuits and by fostering larger class action lawsuits, the real winner under this bill would be trial lawyers. The increased liability that job creators would face could have a chilling effect on wage growth and hiring. Mr. President, rather than threatening companies with new regulations and lawsuits, we should be investing in job training programs for industries that have worker shortages. We should also be helping employers offer their workers more flexibility. Nearly 60% of working households today 
have two working parents. Right now, employees of the federal government can trade in their overtime pay for comp time. That's more time off that they can spend helping their kids or an elderly relative. Non-government workers don't have that option. By giving them the option, and or giving them the option would be a far more, far more helpful thing for Congress to do right now. There are bad things that can and must be prohibited by federal law. Gender-based discrimination is one of them. And Mr. President, it has already been prohibited. There is only so much the government can do. Now, I respect the Senator from Maryland's dedication on this issue. However, I must urge my colleagues to vote this bill down. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you, Senators Bolt, for your statements on the bill. So now, Senators, we have reviewed the provisions, what the bill intends to do if it becomes law. We've heard a statement in support and opposition. You may now have a better idea of where you stand on this bill, but if not, that's perfectly fine. We have compiled some additional information on your tablets that you can access at this time. That includes summaries of the pro and con arguments and interest groups that have declared support and opposition. You can access that information by tapping the little white rectangles at the bottom of those green or red strips. It should cause them to pop out. And then you can scroll up and down, and that might help inform your decision a little further here today. But, as I said, as eloquent and passionate and persuasive as the senators from Maryland and Nebraska undoubtedly were. I would like to open the floor now at this point to any senator here on the floor that has a statement of their own, either in support, opposition, or simply in reaction to this bill. So if you have anything to say on it before we get to our vote, all you gotta do is raise your hand and I'll recognize you and you can make what may be very well your maiden statement here on the Senate floor, which is an exciting moment for any senator. So you can see C-SPAN is here to capture the footage. So, Are there any senators that have uh, any thoughts on this bill? We have one over here. All right, Senator, we'll get you a microphone. Just keep your hand up for a moment there. The floor is yours, Senator. Thank you. I'm just a little confused. Uh, is this about comparable jobs or the exact jobs? Say if a lawyer and a lawyer, or is it just is it like the cafeteria workers? What is this bill? Is it mentioned comparable or exact? So I, I think when, yeah, it would, a man and a woman who occupy the same occupation, if they're being paid less for something other than the bona fide factors that are listed in the bill, which include education and training, then that would appear, according to the language of the bill, to violate the, that prohibition, which would then could result uh, in civil uh, perhaps in civil suits and compensatory or punitive damages. Is it written in the bill at all? Um, you know, it's a very good question. I have the language here, and it's, a, it's not a very long bill, but I can't say that I've read it very recently. You, could, you're free, you feel free to come up and take a look at it afterward. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, unfortunately, I can't claim to be an expert uh, on this particular piece of legislation, as I am very new to the Senate, just as you are. Um, but I, I would be happy to answer that afterwards, Senator. I don't want, to, I want, I don't want you to think I'm, I'm just kicking the can down the road. So we'll, we'll, we'll answer that after. Um, but that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, are there, are there any other, anybody else? Uh, statements, comments, concerns? Let's check in with this side of the aisle first. We just did the Democratic side. Anybody on the Republican side of the aisle want to weigh in here? Sure. Senator, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, uh, I'll be voting no on this, Mr. President. I'm persuaded by my colleague from Nebraska in her uh, well-put arguments. Uh, my concern, uh, and I would note that I am on the Republican side of the chamber, I think this bill, while well-intentioned, uh, imposes another layer of regulation on business and will stifle innovation in our economy and uh, is really ultimately an attempt to gild the lily, literally. Uh, it's unnecessary, and I, I think we've made progress in the area of discrimination in the workplace, and I think uh, this bill is just a bridge too far. I'll be voting no. All right, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, whether you agree or disagree, let's have a, a round of applause for the senator up there in the corner making his maiden statement on the floor. Thank you very much. It appears the senator from Indiana, it appears by your sign. Thank you very much. Uh, let's jump back over on this side of the chamber. Uh, let's go, I saw, yeah, over here. Let's, uh, the gentleman there in the light blue shirt. Let's get that senator a microphone. Senator, the floor is yours. And uh, when you're ready, go right ahead. Yeah, uh, my concern, Mr. President, is about uh, the privacy. Uh, uh, that's this law, I think, would violate 
we have many laws that protect individual privacy. Uh, it seems like this law would require anyone to go uh, to a boss and ask how much I get paid, and I'm concerned about violation of my privacy. All right, excellent. Thank you, Senator. Round of applause for the Senator as well. We'll jump back over to this side of the aisle, if there are any senators here back on this side of the aisle that would like to make a statement. Right up front, Republican leader, no less, has something to say on this bill. Excellent. Go ahead, Senator. The floor is yours. So first of all, I'm totally sitting on the wrong side. I just wanted to be up front. That's OK. <laughs> um, so in response to the senator over on the other side, um, if I understand it correctly, with the whole privacy issue, it's not that people will go to like their their supervisors and bosses and ask, you know, how much does my coworker make? I think it says that you can ask your coworker themselves how much they make. Now whether or not they want to answer is a different story. Um, they don't they don't have to answer if they don't want to. Um, and the other thing I want to bring up, um, kind of a sep separate issue that goes into this is. Um, a lot of uh, anti-feminist groups talk about, uh, with child support, how the men are always the ones that have to pay the child support. And that's usually because child support payment is paid by the parent that makes more money, and that's usually the man. So I think if we want to start seeing, you know, more mothers paying child support and fathers, uh, you know, getting custody, we need to start thinking about equal pay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, round of applause for the senator up front. Jump back over, let's go to the senator there uh, sitting in the Maryland desk. Senator, just raise your hand there for us again so we can see, excellent. Go ahead, senator, the floor is yours. Um, so this debate reminds me a lot of the racial discrimination debate where um, a lot of people for uh, slavery were always uh, saying that there will be economic hindrance if uh, slavery is abolished or um, there will be more harm done than good. But is it morally correct to abolish slavery? Yes, it is. And is it morally correct to have equal pay? Yes, it is. And um, I feel that here in the United States, we always thrive to have morals in accordance with, uh, law in accordance with morals. And um, since I feel like all of us here, whether being Republican or Democrat, agree that women morally uh, should be um, paid equally as men, we should uh, pass this bill to have um, uh, to have this law in accordance with such uh, moral law. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. <laughs> Cutting right through the numbers and the economic argument, getting right to uh, the moral heart of the matter. Very good. Thank you, Senator. We'll jump back over on to the Republican side of the aisle, if there are any senators back on this side that would like to make a statement. All right, on the aisle here, we'll get you a microphone in just a moment, Senator. Just keep your hand up there for a second so we know. Excellent. There you go. Go ahead, Senator. The floor is yours. Well, I was just wondering, would this bill then take away the, uh, the rights of employers to really control uh, the pay wages that they give to individuals who they feel are doing a better job than other individuals at the same position? Uh, it sort of kind of locks them into the uh, position of, you know, not allowing them any freedom to pay as they see fit for the better worker, in my mind. So to, to address that very briefly, as the senator from uh, Nebraska mentioned, uh, she was concerned that perhaps this bill could have what she called a chilling effect on uh, not just hiring decisions, but then also wage decisions. There is concern uh, among some senators uh, in the United States Senate uh, that yes, it will, it will make it more difficult for employers to, uh, to participate in merit pay or to, to reward merit pay to employers. Uh, whether or not you believe that is ultimately going to be up to all of you. It's hard for me to say from my perspective being not an expert in the field, but uh, it's a legitimate concern perhaps for some that this could threaten merit pay uh, for some employers because they'd be worried about being penalized for that. Well, well it's not just merit pay, but I'm, I'm thinking that um, they just lose all rights to decide that this is a better worker in this position and they should be paid a little more than another worker, whether it be male or female. They just lose that ability at all because they would be facing a civil suit. They'd have to say, well, I gotta pay everyone equal at that level, at that job. 
So well, the bill. I, you know, uh, I think it really uh, binds the employers to some degree. If the, according to the language of the bill itself, but if the employers were to show, if they could show, uh, that that merit pay or that raise or that difference was based on what the bill calls bona fide factors, which include things like experience uh, and education and training, uh, then that would be, that would be permissible and that would be permitted by the bill. So there are ways in which uh, employers could uh, still reward workers uh, who they deem to be perhaps more experienced or more well trained in their job and they could show, if they could show that by the language of the bill, they wouldn't have anything to worry about. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Senator. A round of applause for the Senator there in the aisle. The Senator uh, here on the aisle, um, Senator from Nebraska, if you just grab the Senator there from uh, Washington, it appears. Go ahead, Senator, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Senator. My question for debate is, uh, we hear about um, equal pay for equal work. We hear about the disparity of women workers versus men workers. Will, uh, I did not see anything or hear anything in the discussion about equal protection for males who may potentially be underpaid to their female colleagues. Is this bill intended to be gender neutral in terms of how it will approach resolving these issues? Yes, yeah, so as, first of all, I'll address something some, somewhat tangential to that. So as the Senator from Maryland pointed out, certainly uh, it is not permitted by this bill or the Equal Pay Act of 1963 that male workers would, uh, would suffer or suffer losses in their pay because of equality of pay with their female counterparts. Uh, but yes, the bill uh, is, is not necessarily uh, gender specific. So perhaps if male employees could demonstrate as well uh, that they were being paid less for factors other than these bona fide factors, they would perhaps also have uh, the capacity uh, to bring a civil suit against that employer as well. Yeah, there's nothing in there that just says that women are the only ones that can do this. Uh, are there any other statements or, or comments? How about, let's check back in on this side of the aisle first, in the interest of fairness. If not, we can jump back over to this side. How about we go in the corner there? Go ahead, Senator, the floor is yours. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'd like to support the bill um, because I feel that the typical argument that comes from that side of the aisle is always about government <clears throat> over-regulating small businesses or large businesses, and I don't see this as a very um, heavily, um, like not, not a lot of mandates coming on top of employers. It's pretty um, straightforward what uh, people are allowed to, to do, and to say that this is a burden on business, I think is somewhat of a red herring, and I think that we've experienced a lot of deregulation uh, in the last couple of years that have led to all sorts of problems, so um, if ever there was a time to believe that maybe slightly more regulation is appropriate, I think now's the time in order to help move things forward. Excellent, thank you very much, Senator. A round of applause for the Senator there. Again, we'll go back to the other side of the aisle. Check in once again if anything has materialized, crystallized, anything at all. If not, that's fine. I think we have time maybe for another statement or two, I believe. Yes, I saw the senator there in the third row. Yep, uh, we'll get you a microphone there, Senator. Go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I had two questions, actually, I wanted to address. One was that one of the con arguments was the exchange of comp time for overtime pay, and I'm not quite sure how this applies to the bill. Um, that was one of my questions, so maybe you can explain that. The other thing is that I don't think that this bill really addresses is that job descriptions. Um, I, I find that in some cases that in, like, say, a male, maybe in the, like you're in the same, technically doing the same thing, but they'll add a line to his job extension that he has to about take the mail out to the mailbox, which would move him up to a different level. And that isn't really fair either. So I know it doesn't address that, but that was just another issue I wanted to point out. Excellent, thank you very much, Senator. Now I can uh, address, yeah, a round of applause for the Senator as well. Uh, I, will address, I will address briefly uh, your question about uh, the comp time, or the argument uh, from the Republican Senator about that. Uh, if I'm understanding the Senator from Nebraska's argument uh, clearly, I believe what she's suggesting is that allowing private sector workers the ability to uh, enter into contracts with their employer that allow them comp time instead of overpay time, which is something that federal employees can currently do, is, in her opinion, and perhaps the Republican uh, opinion that 
uh, that is a better alternative to perhaps what this bill does. Because as she suggested, this, pay, uh, this uh, discrimination in pay or prohibition against that discrimination was established in the, uh, the, the 1963 law that was signed by President Kennedy. Um, and of course, you're, you are free to disagree with her or agree with her as you see fit. But it seems that the argument is that it's a, it's a preferable alternative from, from that perspective. Anything else before we proceed to our vote? Excellent. We'll, we'll end there. The senator on the corner. Go ahead, Senator. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I would um, like to compliment the a senator from Maryland for trying to bring this forward to make it the pay equity. Because historically, the our employers have not done the right thing on this very important issue of pay equity, especially towards women and people that are mi of minorities. I have experienced this myself, so I know how they play. And in regards to the merit pay, I did not see our good friend from Nebraska show me any statistics or things of who gets that merit pay. Do men usually get that merit pay over women? Do Caucasians get it over African Americans, over Native Americans, over Asians, over Latinos? Who gets this merit pay? So I also have kind of a concern that maternity leave. All of a sudden, men get maternity leave. But women, according to, I think, a representative from Nebraska, says, but women should be able to take their comp time, and they should go home and take care of that child or take care of that elder. So why do men need maternity pay and maternity leave? So I am going to vote um, in favor of our good senator from Maryland, because I do believe that there needs to be some regulations on our industries that have not done the right thing when they should have and had their own opportunity to do so. So thank you very much. And I also thank the senator from Nebraska for her opinion. And let's move this forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. <laughs> Eloquent defense and a statement argument in favor of this piece of legislation. Anything else before we proceed to our vote, Senators? All right, in that case, the chair can take a hand. Thank you to all the senators who contributed to this. The congressional record is now full of wonderful statements and comments on this bill. Uh, now, we're going to proceed to our vote. Before we do, it's important to note that senators often have to weigh and balance sometimes conflicting interests, be it the, uh, their interests of their party, their state, their own personal beliefs. Now, if such a conflict of interest arises for you this evening, I certainly wish you luck in resolving it in a way that's perhaps beneficial for all these interests and yourself. Now, in the Senate... We, uh, we generally do roll call votes in which our legislative clerk would call on each of you by name uh, and then you would voice your vote or perhaps you'd give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Uh, but as you can see, our legislative clerk left at five. Uh, so we're going to do something a little different. We're going to vote on our tablets. Now, in the Senate, like I said, they generally do roll call votes. They voice their vote. In a moment, you're going to see two buttons appear on your tablet screen. One of them is going to have this word on it. And what does this word say? It reads yay. And I certainly don't blame you for thinking it's pronounced yay. But in the Senate, it's actually generally pronounced I, which makes sense if you move the A to the front of the word, which is not where it is. So I understand if you're confused. But it's actually pronounced I. If you're opposed to the bill, you're going to see a button with that word on it. What does that word say? It reads nay. That's not how it's pronounced in the Senate. In fact, that word is pronounced no. Welcome to the United States Senate, where words are made up and spelling doesn't matter. There's actually a legitimate reason for this. Yay and nay rhyme, the legislative clerk might mishear you, might misregister your vote. Dreadfully embarrassing for everybody. So instead it's I and no. But like I said, you're not gonna have to say anything, you're just gonna have to press a button. So press the I button if you support this bill and want it to pass. Press the no button if you oppose this bill and want it to fail. Senators, you may begin at this time. And if there are any senators whose tablets are not letting them vote, just raise your hand, we'll come around and we'll collect a voice vote the old fashioned way. Oh, looks like we'll get another tablet for you there, Senator. You can vote on that one. Uh, you will know that your vote has registered if one of those boxes is higher than the other. Okay? That's how you know your, your vote has been counted. And again, if anybody's having any difficulty, just raise your hand let us know. All right.
right, looks like we're getting there, and looks like uh, everybody's getting a chance to get their vote in. Some people are changing their votes around. I'm not quite sure. Uh, all right, voting will be, uh, will be open for three more seconds. All right, voting is now closed. And in this instance, congratulations, senators. You have passed this piece of legislation quite overwhelmingly, it seems, as well. Congratulations. It's a momentous achievement, a, a momentous day, a momentous night in the Senate when we pass a piece of legislation. Now, that does have something to do with contemporary politics. But to be fair to any given Congress, it also has to do with design. Right? The framers intended the Senate to be a deliberative body, to take its time with legislation, to be removed somewhat from the popular populist sentiments of the people. That's in part why senators were given six-year terms, the longest of any elected official in the United States government. It's also in part why they were not originally directly elected by the people, but appointed by state legislatures instead. Uh, but in this particular instance, it appears that the Senate, or at least a, a, a vast majority of the Senate, uh, seemed pretty firm on this and, and thought it was the right thing to do. Now, at the same time, I would like to commend the 10 senators who voted in principled opposition to this bill because it is not your job as a senator to vote for what you think will be the winning side or the most popular side, even in the face of overwhelming support. It takes a lot of guts and courage to stand up to such a, a majority and also represent your interests as you see fit. And for that, you deserve commendation as well, even if you didn't carry the day today. Now, I just want to point out very quickly some national opinion polling. So you see the breakdown of our chamber today, right? 82% in favor, 18% uh, opposed. And we've got some polling data here. Now, this polling data is from a Pew Research Center poll that was done in November of 2014. And when asked, when respondents were asked whether this country needs to continue making changes to give men and women equality in the workplace, 72% responded yes, and 28% either responded no or they were not sure. So as you can see, uh, an overwhelming majority of Americans, according to this poll, seem to think that we still do have some work to do in order to achieve that equality in the workforce uh, between men and women. Perhaps this bill was a step in the right direction. Uh, so, Senators, thank you so much for coming in this evening. Uh, a late-night session of the Senate, very rare, but very happy to have you all here. If you have any questions about the bill, we could uh, come up and, and read it, perhaps, and clarify that question earlier. Or any questions about the Senate generally, uh, about the topic generally, feel free to come on up and speak to us. We'd be happy to speak to you. Otherwise, Senators, this session is now adjourned. Thank you very much, folks.